Welcome to the vineyard. Uh, we're going to worship for a few minutes so you can, guys can feel free to stand and we'll worship together. I'm just going to pray before we get started. Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you for everyone that you brought here. Lord, I know it's been a really cold week and I often think about getting somewhere warm that I need to get out of here. <laughs> and Father, I pray that I remember that promise in Scripture that all who are weary to come to you. And so Jesus, as we worship together today, I pray that you'd help us just to come to you. Savior, I need a friend, I need to know you, beyond what I have known, I need a father to welcome me home. Where the blind will find to see your face Where the mute will finally sing your praise Where the lost will finally know your ways Where tomorrow becomes today Alpha Omega and end to all that you promised to all that you planned fill me with passion fill me with flame to go where you send me Lord, to go in your name, where the blind will finally see your face, where the mute will finally sing your praise, where the lost will finally know your ways, where tomorrow becomes today where the blind where the blind will find see your face where the mute will finally sing your praise where the lost will finally know your ways where tomorrow becomes today Break the darkness and its hold on me. Holy Spirit, set the captives free. Let your kingdom speak and touch through me. Holy Spirit, set the captives free. Break the darkness and its hold on me. Holy Spirit, set the captives free. Let your kingdom speak 
can touch through me. Holy Spirit, set the captives free. Where the blind will finally see your face. Where the mute will finally sing your praise. Where the lost will finally know your ways. Where tomorrow becomes today. Where the blind, where the blind will finally see your face. Where the mute will finally sing your praise. Where the lost will finally know your ways. Where tomorrow becomes today. dark ones stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made new we do is all creation groaning it is is a new creation coming? It is. And is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. And is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is.
Brian, one of the pastors here, and we're going to continue our worship. Man, it's just amazing to think about what Jesus has done for us, as we just sang about. And we're going to come to the communion table to remember a really specific way uh, that Jesus offered up his life on the cross, that he uh, shed his blood, he offered up his body so that we could have a brand new kind of relationship with God. And as I was praying about our time this morning, I was just thinking about how communion gives us this opportunity to remember this great exchange that happens, that we give Jesus our sin and somehow he gives us his righteousness in return. We give him our shame. And he gives us his goodness. And so I want to invite you, as we continue in worship, um, to partake of communion. If you're watching online, you can grab some elements for yourself there. As you take that bread, as you take that cup, do that wonderful exchange again, saying, Jesus, here's all my junk, here's all my brokenness. And in return, I just receive your goodness, your righteousness. God, would you do that in us as we worship you now through communion. Let's continue to worship and invite you to take communion.
come from your heart, oh Lord, in us, Jesus, your heart. I want to love the things you love. I want to hate the things you hate. As your heart is formed inside us, may we learn to walk in grace and extend a hand of mercy set the captives free bringing freedom to the prison bringing hope the blind can see mercy triumphs over judgment mercy triumphs over judgment mercy triumphs over judgment Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Say yes, Lord. We say yes, Lord. We say yes, Lord. We say yes. We say yes. We say. We say. over judgment yeah father i love the words of those songs may that just be true in all of our lives lord may we just be a demonstration of your your mercy lord as we receive it and as we extend it to those around us father amen you guys can take a seat. I want to welcome up Clint and Becca. Good morning. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, special welcome if you're here. And if you're online, thanks for joining us. Hope that you're, you're cozy and safe and that you're feeling okay. Absolutely. Should we talk about your hat? I made this hat. For those that don't know, Clint, look, yes, absolutely applause yeah, for it's his impressive. hat. It's impressive. I'm impressed with myself. Thank you. Clint is a man of many hobbies. He's always trying new things. Mm -hmm. His newest thing is crocheting. Uh huh. This is hat number four. Including a hat for himself. Is it? Hat one through three. They weren't great. But here we are. Mm -hmm. Hat number four. Mm -hmm. How else? How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing fine. Becca, Wonderful. How, how are you? I'm doing great. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, thank you for coming to the Vineyard. Here we're all about loving God and loving people. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to be a community that uh, like we, we grow like in our relationship with God, but we do that so that we can go and serve other people. So we always want to be mindful of things that are going around, uh, not only in our church community, but also the wider Twin Ports area. Uh, so today we just wanted to highlight that this week, one of the youth shelters in town closed. Uh, we lost 10 beds, which may not seem like a lot, but that's, you know, 10 spaces for youths between the ages of 15 and 19 to get shelter. Um, we don't really know what the future of that holds, um, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to take just a little time and to, to pray for homeless youth. Absolutely. So let's do that. God, we know that you are always at work in our community, even in the midst of when we learn about tough things like this. When we go, gosh, there's something else really hard going on. It can be really overwhelming. But God, none of these things overwhelm you. 
So God, we do ask that you would provide, that you would show up, that your kingdom would come in the midst of homelessness in our community. God, and I pray for each one of us here online that you would just maybe tap us on the shoulder if you're inviting us to somehow get involved in the midst of this. God, we trust that you have incredible things for every single human being, and particularly those that are specifically impacted by this loss. Amen. Amen. And Clint, if we feel like this is maybe something we do want to get involved with, what should we do? Do, right really quickly we're like oh there's a thing that i can do but how do we actually yeah because that's where the rubber meets the road you know we right. want to put our faith in action so if uh, any of this stuff like is stirring stuff in your hearts come find me afterwards uh i would love to to help you get involved help just to i don't know even just be a resource no matter what god has put on your heart as a way to serve the folks around you in the bigger community uh come find me afterwards and we can chat and we can figure it out together Another consideration also could be to fill out our connect form. And so our connect form, we have a QR code. And if you're also going, oh gosh, I don't have time to talk to that guy in the green hat, you can fill out the connect form that way and put your contact information and he can find you there. Connect form really is an opportunity for us to find out things going on in your life, ways we can partner with you, ways maybe you have something that you want to partner with in our community or in the greater Twin Ports community. So we'd love to invite you to fill that out. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different ways to get involved here at the Vineyard. You know, we have different classes, different service opportunities, and you can find information about those in our uh, brand new current magazine that's out in the rack, just out in the lobby, or in our volunteer guide, which has recently been updated with everything that's going on here. So pick up one yep. of those on your way out if you want to get more involved. Absolutely. And speaking of things you can read about in the current, next Sunday we have... Yeah, we have Welcome our to uh, Welcome to the Vineyard class coming up at 6.30. So this is kind of an intro to who we are as a community. You know, how the Vineyard fits into the wider church, history, mission, values. Uh, it's a chance to interact with some of our staff members. And so really, this is a great first step if you're newer to the community or wanting to get more involved. So come check out this class. And then this is one of the things that you have to do if you want to be, be a, a member. formal member mm -hmm. of the church. Yeah, we'll also feed you dinner. So if you're just hungry next Sunday night and want to come check out and have a conversation, we'd love to have you join us. Because dinner's always good. Dinner's delicious. All right. And we something else we do every single week is we talk about giving. Why? Because the Bible talks about giving a lot. And so we have a verse we want to highlight this morning out of Proverbs. Proverbs 3 verses 9 and 10 say, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. What I love about these verses is that there's a promise there. When we trust God, first and foremost, maybe when we're doing our budgets or when we think about our finances, he makes a promise that he will care for us. And so there's just a really lovely opportunity to really say, God, everything I have, including my finances, is yours. And so we have lots of different ways to give in person and online. We have the baskets that are about to be coming around. You can text and all the things. But as we do that, let me pray. God, I thank you that you are always inviting us into more, not out of, again, guilt or shame or anything like that, but really in saying, when we choose to really hope and handedly hold our entire lives before you, there's an opportunity for, your, for you to show up, for you to take care of us, for you to use the things that we have to really bless both us and other people. And so, God, I pray that maybe for each of us as we're showing up this morning that you would surprise us with your goodness. So God, we thank you that you care, again, about every single part of our lives. And we thank you that however we respond to giving, that it never changes how much you care about us. God, we thank you for your incredible love in our lives. Amen. Amen. So as those baskets are going around, we have a couple more things that we just want to point out to everybody. Um, we have small groups that are going to start up we do. here at the beginning of February. Yeah. I heard uh, a woo somewhere. Was yeah, that you? That was Brian, about small our small group yeah. pastor over there. Woo! So uh, we just love small groups because small groups are a chance to really be known, to get to know people, you know, hear what's going on in their lives, share what's going on in yours, to connect at kind of a, a deeper level than we can actually do here on Sunday morning. And also, it's just a really great opportunity to grow in your relationship with God. I mean, it's, it was in uh, like kind of that small group context that I first learned, like really how to pray and like how mm -hmm. God speaks to me. It's where I learned to study the Bible and it's really where I learned to serve others. Yeah. So if uh, you're really looking to continue your growth, uh, pick up one of those. There's a bunch of small group information out in the lobby or you can hop on the website. Find a group that uh, that works for you. Check out a couple of them. Absolutely. Because like this is, this is really good stuff. 
Yeah, and I would say the way that I got involved in the vineyard was through small groups. I attended on Sunday, but sometimes it's really hard to meet people. Small groups is a great way to meet people and to start to get involved. And so, again, this Mm -hmm. is a great time to consider that as February is just around the corner. Speaking about February being just around the corner. How did that happen already? I know, right? I'm not ready. But we still got another week and a half, so let's all take a deep breath. We're not through yet. Maybe we want to be, though, because January, it's the toughest month, right? Is January the toughest month? I think it might be. Anyway, we can have a conversation about that later. But on February 1st, men, we have Brenner. Yes, breakfast for dinner, brupper, I don't know. Is there another thing that we call it? Not me. All right, those are the two options that we have. But we're super excited about this opportunity. We have Danny Mercado who's going to be joining us. Danny Mercado is an incredible pastor out of the Chicagoland area. And he actually, kind of in the vineyard movement, he oversees kind of our area of churches. So Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Chicago. Danny really, truly is just a lovely human being. He's so kind. He's so compassionate. And he loves Jesus. Jesus so, so much. And so, men, I would love to invite you to come out and hear him. Again, we'll feed you dinner. We'll get to spend some time worshiping, talking together, praying. It'll be a lot of fun. Danny's a real deal. It's going to be a good time. Uh, And then also at the beginning of February, we have another night of worship coming up. Uh, You know, Vineyard, we love to worship. Worship becomes this really cool kind of gateway to experience God's love, his grace, his mercy, and his compassion. So we want to create some extra space to just worship God. So we're going to do that Sunday, February 4th at 6.30. And this is just what it sounds like. It's a night of worship, extended worship, some prayer, and just the chance to be together. So I want to invite everybody to come back to that because it's always amazing, and the Holy Spirit always shows up in powerful ways. I mean, no big deal, but you said always multiple times. So, Mm -hmm. like, you really sold that. All right. I believe it, Becca. Okay, great. (laughs) I'm excited. All right. So something that we do once a year that we are just about to start is our all-church survey. Yay, yeah, I love that. So Everyone's excited. like, I don't know, should I be excited about that? You should. Surveys are so fun, aren't they? We're going to do our best to make this survey fun. So much so that we're all going to take it together right now. Clint, why in the world do we do this? Uh, this really just kind of helps us see who are members of our community, you know, where everybody's at in their relationship with God, in their relationship with people. And then we look at that data and then kind of use that throughout the year to plan ways to help all of us grow together. Absolutely. And so as you'll see on the screen, there's a QR code. If you're online, you should have a code as well. Also, if you don't have one of those phones that can scan these things, we have paper copies as well. You can even, we have um, a couple folks in the back. I see Barb with her hand up over there. So if you need a paper copy, just raise your hand and we will absolutely get you one. Again, this is really important for us to just go, who are we? And how can we as a community to continue to learn and grow together? And this information really helps us do that. And so we're just going to take the next few minutes to do it. Clint and I are going to do it as well. We sure are. We sure are. And so we're going to put some music on and go ahead and scan it. Or like I said, grab a paper copy and let's take this quiz together. Is there, do you think we get a fun prize at that? Yeah, a free cup of coffee. (laughs) What if I don't drink coffee? I'm a tea drinker. That's (laughs) okay. Don't tell everyone the answers. Don't tell everyone how old I am. I have to try to get me now. (laughs) Almost have me (laughs) thinking. There's no hope to be found. The voice of the accuser won't have the final say. Skulls are empty threats of yesterday. I'm waking up.
We should have had that turned up. That was a solid finish, wasn't it? Well, you can continue to fill out your survey if you're not done, but we are super excited to welcome up Brian, and he's going to be talking to us more about the character of Jesus of awesome. goodness. Thank you, guys. I'm not done. Hey, let's give uh, Clint and Becca a hand for being fun. You know, we've got, like, the survey, which is, it's fun, kind of. You know, but we do it, so that's great. Hey, good morning. It's great to see everybody here in person. Welcome to those of you online as well. Uh, to begin 2044 here at the Vineyard, um, we decided to do a pretty unique uh, sermon series. And we've called it Seeing Jesus, a Character Worth Having. And here's the idea behind it. We're looking at stories where Jesus lived out what we call the fruits of the Spirit, these qualities like love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, etc. And our goal is to see and be enthralled by Jesus and his stunningly beautiful character. And we're doing this um, also because it's a big part of how we actually grow. By seeing Jesus and experiencing Jesus' character, what we do is we open the door for the Holy Spirit to make us more like him. And this week, as I was thinking about uh, this process, I was remembering a little punchy phrase I heard a number of years ago, uh, and it goes like this. Uh, we become what we behold. Just you say that out loud with me? We become what we behold. Friends, we are shaped by what captures our attention and our affections. Think about it. If your thoughts are dominated by the goal of acquiring money and tons of possessions, uh, that's going to shape you in significant ways. Similarly, if you're consistently taking in maybe like images of violence or sex, you know, different things like that, that's going to form your inner life over time. And if you're listening to like the steady stream of us versus them, partisan politics, like that's going to have an impact 
on your heart. So what we thought about for beginning 2024 is we want to do something really specific. We want to make a choice. In contrast, we want to have our lives this year be shaped most consistently and most significantly by the person of Jesus, who Jesus is, what his character is like, what that can look like in our lives. We want our character to be more like his. We want to behold Jesus so that we can become more and more like him. And here's the beauty behind this. You know, uh, as we turn our eyes towards him, what we see is that Jesus shows us exactly what God is like. Uh, you know, we look, read in the book of Hebrews that, that God is, is showing himself up in the image of his son, Jesus. And Jesus shows us what humans were created to be. Christians believe that Jesus is 100% God and he's 100% human. And so we get both of those pictures. We get this amazing in the flesh picture of who God is. This God of the universe that created everything, that sustains everything, that's going to make all things new again. What's he like? He's like Jesus. But we also get to see what are human beings supposed to be like? Again, we look back to Jesus and we say, Jesus is the perfect human being. He's the perfect model. He's this perfect picture of what we were ultimately created to be like. But how does this happen? How do we become more like Jesus? And specifically today, we want to ask, how do we become good like Jesus is good? And does that take place just by like, trying harder, by being more earnest? I don't think that's the path. Instead, this kind of change occurs as we see Jesus' goodness and we let God be good to us. And over time, what happens is his goodness, it really does transform us. It motivates us. It makes us good, more like Jesus is good. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I want you to go grab a Bible. Um, If you're here in person, you can go ahead and turn to page 709. Maybe pull that up on your device. You've already got your, uh, remember, you got your phones out to be able to do the survey. And in the passage we're going to look at today, um, Jesus is going to be good uh, to a guy that's actually trying to trick him. He's trying to trap Jesus. And Jesus is going to show us what real goodness looks like by telling us an eye-opening story. I'll read that in just a moment, but let me pray um, as you guys find that. God, um, as we sang a few moments ago, um, it is really our hearts, not only for today, but as we begin this new year, um, to have you form us. God, we want to be shaped by who you are. God, there's so many other things that we could give our attention and our affections to, but God, we're choosing again today to say we want you to form us. Jesus will want your character, your life to be what shapes ours. And so just any little bit, any big bit that you want to do in that today, we just invite that now in your name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to be in Luke chapter 10. Uh, We're going to start in verse 25 and get to the beginning. I'm just going to buy this um, just a little bit by a bit. Okay, so it begins. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Okay, so there's this guy, he's not a lawyer like we would know uh, in our day, but he's more like maybe like a seminary professor or a philosophy professor. Uh, He was this guy that spent a ton of time thinking deeply about God and life, but he comes to Jesus to test him. He says, teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's asking, like, what must I do to have this kind of life that God has, the kind of life that God has built us for? And in Jesus' classic fashion, he rarely gives a straight answer, but instead he forces this guy to think a little bit deeper by answering his question with a question. We continue on. It says, what is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Okay, so let's pause again. You remember that this guy is trying to trap Jesus. You know, actually doing this, loving God, loving people in this way, it's darn right impossible to be that good all the time. And so maybe this guy was expecting Jesus to water it down, you know, maybe say something like, well, just try your best 
do a good enough job, you know, and it'll all be good. <laughs> you know, or just believe in me and you can kind of just do whatever you want. But man, Jesus surprises this guy. He surprises us. He sets the bar high, <laughs> like at perfection. And down deep, this guy has to know, like he can't do this all the time with everyone. Listen to how the narrative continues in verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself, and so he asked Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? He's asking Jesus, like, can we just limit this down to make it more doable and workable? That's when Jesus tells this story, famous story. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and well, he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw the man, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring, oil on, uh, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, and when I return, I will re reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Jesus turns back to the man and he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Wow. <laughs> Jesus, he is the master at telling stories with a point. And he gives us such a powerful example of goodness in this exchange with this man that, again, is trying to trick him, trying to trap him. And yet Jesus turns this all on its head and shows this amazing picture of goodness. The story that we call the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is good because he takes a risk to help this guy. This road is super dangerous, and he takes his life in his own hands even to stop. He helps in concrete, practical ways. He doesn't just say a little prayer you know, for this guy as he runs on by. He actually stops, he gives medical treatment and rescue transportation, brings him to this place where this guy can experience health and healing. And all of this happens to a sworn enemy. We know that this story is called the Good Samaritan, but in that day, uh, to the Jews, there was no such thing as a Good Samaritan. Samaritans were the despised enemies of the Jews. Do you see what's happening here? When the expert in the law wants to justify himself, wants to trick Jesus, Jesus' response is to tell this story. He ups the ante about what goodness looks like, and it says meaning, it means risking your life to provide meaningful assistance, including to maybe even people that we hate. And again, this isn't just theory. Jesus finishes his exchange by saying, you, go and do likewise. Again, the expert in the law has to be thinking, screaming inside, like, but I can't do it. <laughs> you know, nobody is that good. And friends, that is actually one of Jesus' main points. He's pushing this guy, and he's pushing us to this place where we recognize we can't do this on our own. We can't measure up. You see, we notice where God is good when he actually shows us where we're not. <laughs> God is good when he shows us that we are not. Friends, real goodness doesn't begin until we actually see that we can't be good on our own. I mean, think about it. If, if you know, uh, if, if you don't know that you're sick and that you're going to die, you'd never seek treatment. You know, you never get surgery. You never pursue things like a, a chemo or something else that would save your life. But when the doctor tells you that you have cancer, even though it's a highly treatable form of cancer, she's actually doing you a huge favor. That's goodness in action. And this is what God does for us and our souls and our spiritual lives. And this is what Jesus did over and over again for people when he was on earth. 
And if we listen, I think this is what the Holy Spirit may be doing with us even this morning. The Apostle Paul in Romans 3 makes this point brilliantly where he writes, all, all of us have turned away. They've all together become worthless. There's no one that does good, not even one. Let the reality sink in. Yeah, that may be a hard pill to swallow, but it actually is really helpful. On our own, we really can't do good. We always are going to have mixed motives. Bad intentions will sneak in. And a huge part of why God gives us the instructions that he does, the law, is to show us that we actually can't do it. We can't measure up on our own. Later, Paul writes in verse 20, he says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law, by your own effort. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. See how this works? God is good, actually, when he helps us give up on ourselves. He wants us to so bad see that we cannot do it. For us to admit, to simply say, God, I can't do it. I need your help. Cool story along these lines. All the way back from 1741, uh, there's this guy named Nathan Cole. And he thought he was doing pretty good in life. Uh, he was a pretty religious person, he thought. And then he went to hear um, this famous preacher, a guy named George Whitfield, that was touring around uh, the colonies during that time. And here's what Nathan Cole wrote about this experience. He says, in my hearing Whitfield preach, it gave me a heart wound by God's blessing. My old foundation was broken up, and I saw that my righteousness could not save me. I think if we're bold enough, if we're courageous to admit, many of us are kind of like Nathan Cole. We can kind of think like, hey, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm doing pretty good. I'm better than that person or this person. You know, he might have thought if he lived a good life, he did the best he could, it'd all be good. He'd be in. It hurt to find out that that actually wasn't true. It was a heart wound, like you mentioned. But it was also a huge, huge blessing to have his foundation of self-righteousness be destroyed, to be broken up, and God was being good to him by showing him that he was actually not. Friends, it's the same thing with us. God is good to us as he helps us to see the ways that we can do this. You know, we don't actually start following Jesus or start to make him, um, have him make us good until we feel this kind of a heart wound ourselves until we give up on ourselves and we just go to Jesus empty-handed. Now, in Luke 10, in this interaction, Jesus longed for that expert in the law to admit, I, I can't do it. I can't be good. And that's what he wants for us. If we can humble ourselves, we listen. Jesus can say, you're right. <laughs> you can't do it, but I can. And I'm offering you my goodness if you're just willing to receive it. That brings us to our next point. Secondly, we see that God is good when he shows us his goodness. Uh, one of my favorite examples of God showing his goodness uh, uh, shows up in the first part of the, the Bible, the Old Testament. And it's a story in, in the book of Exodus uh, where we see this guy, Moses. Moses has been working for God. He's been doing lots of things for God for a long time, delivering the people out of Egypt. And there's this one day where Moses asks to see God and to see his glory. And God says, ah, can't do that, Mo. Like, if you do that, like, it'll kill you. <laughs> but he says, I will give you something. Here's what we read in Exodus 33. The Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he says, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And so as the story goes on, Moses goes in the cleft of this rock. God kind of covers him with his hand to protect Moses as he passes by. It's kind of a comical see, uh, scene because it's like God says, you can't see my face, but you can kind of see my backside. Don't get thrown out by that. You know, the whole point of this is that God is describing um, not only that, uh, he, he's not only giving his, his goodness, but he's actually describing what it's like. He described his goodness for Moses and for us. Read more about this in Exodus 34. As he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, 
The Lord, the God, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. So this is the God that we see, this God of goodness, that he's a God of love with so much love and compassion, a God of second chances, of forgiveness. And he's a God of justice. He's a God of making things right, of calling things to account as are needed. And so we see this picture of a good God, that he didn't just create a good world that we messed up, but he is good, completely and totally good. In the second half of the Bible, in the New Testament, um, I don't think that there's a, any better description, summarization in one sentence of God's goodness than this out of John chapter three. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And here's why I bring that, that particular verse, certainly one of the most famous verses ever, but it relates back to the story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan. As Jesus tells this story of goodness, he has it take place on a dangerous road between Jericho and Jerusalem. Do you know where Jesus was at (laughs) when he's telling this story? He was on a road on his way to Jerusalem. He was right there. Jesus is headed towards Jerusalem. He himself is on this road. He is going to Jerusalem to lay his life down. He's going to offer up his perfect life as the payment for all of our sins so that we can have our righteousness. That's what we talked about in communion, right? This great exchange. We give all of our brokenness to God, and he gives us his righteousness and his goodness in exchange. Jesus is putting himself in danger, certain death, to do something wonderfully concrete and practical. He was going to free us from sin and death. And he did it while we were still his enemies, still rebelling against our true king, He suffered and he died. He experienced hell in our place for you and for me. There's no better example of God's goodness than this, that Jesus would be the one that would show us goodness in these exact ways by offering up his life. It's worth asking. We're checking in. Like, where are we at with this? Have we experienced this kind of goodness from God? Have we felt that good heart wound that Nathan Cole talked about? You know, of realizing, I can't do this on my own. I can never muster up enough to be able to sufficiently be good. Have we given up on ourselves and gone to Jesus empty handed? Have we received his goodness as our own? If not, that is God's invitation to us, to simply come to him, Humbly, open-handed, realize that we can't do it, but that particularly in Jesus, God has showed his goodness to us. He has made it available to us, and that we can be able to step into that as we look to him. Whenever we take the step to behold what Jesus did for us on the cross, it centers us on his love and his goodness. And here's the deal, friends. You and I, until we see Jesus as our good Samaritan, we're never going to be able to step into (laughs) being that kind of a person to somebody else. We need to know that God has done that kind of rescue for us, that he has been good to us in that way, and let that have its good work in us. So even on Holy Spirit, would you just help us to do that today? To see the truth about ourselves, (laughs) that we're never going to get there on our own. We're a mess. We can't save ourselves. We can't be that good. But you are. And so help us to receive your rescue, the goodness that Jesus bought for us on the cross and secured with his resurrection. Amen. Amen.
Okay, there's another part to Jesus' story um, that he tells here with the Good Samaritan. And it's kind of more practical. Um, it's about how do we walk this out? How do we be part of God's family as a follower of Jesus? Yeah, and some of us might think, like, you know, hey, if we see God's goodness and grace, we just get our ticket to heaven, and that's all good. You know, like, thank you, Jesus. Now I just need to wait out my little Christian life, my little Christian bubble, feeling isolated and secure like the priest and the Levite. <laughs> is that what we're after? Or is following Jesus actually a lot about coming to life right now, about taking on his character about becoming more like Jesus, more good like Jesus, actually on this side of heaven. I think that's what God invites us into. And that's one of the other things that this story shows us, is that following Jesus is about extending God's goodness, his grace, and his love to the whole world right now as we become more like him. It's about God making us good so that we will share his goodness with our neighbors, with our friends, with our relatives, coworkers, all the people that we come across, even to our enemies. A miraculous thing that God can do in us. And that brings us to our third point for today. God shows his goodness. God is good when he makes us good. This is the work that God has decided to do, to make us good like Jesus is good. Now, that sounds good, but you know, it sounds great, but our pride, it's so powerful. It's so subtly sneaky. We so desperately want to be good on our own. Loads of us can still try to earn it, but God is the one that's most at work here. As I was prepping um, a little bit for today, just thinking back to some of my own story. Remember, you know, I grew up, um, you know, a small community in Iowa. I grew up on a farm, the small town uh, church, and many wonderful things about that experience. It's where I first heard about Jesus. I first uh, learned about what Jesus had done to die for us on the cross, about his resurrection. And as a teenager, like there was something about that that was real, and I stepped into. And I don't know where this fits in with, you know, how much it was about the system, how much it was just about my own brokenness. But as I was continuing to try to like walk this out, here was a lot of how I thought about this. It was like, believe in Jesus, try and be a good person. Like that was kind of what I internalized about what this whole thing was about. You know, kind of do this thing of believing in Jesus and then just try really hard to be good. Has anybody tried that before? <laughs> it's exhausting. And it doesn't work very good, you know? And so over the next number of years, I just thought, I found myself so frustrated. Like, if this is really good news, how does this actually work? How does this actually work? And so much of where I started to gain traction in this was where we first started today. We become what we behold. There was something that God began to do in my life where it was less about just managing my behavior and it was more about gazing upon his beauty. It was less about just trying really, really hard <laughs> to be this kind of person, whether it was just trying to internally or trying to impress other people. And it was more about being captured by the wonder of who Jesus is and simply saying, Jesus, would you do that kind of work in me? All these decades later, I'm still in process on this. <laughs> I'm still not where I want to be, but thank God that he is never going to be done with me. He's never going to be done with any of us. But one of the wonderful things that I learned in that time was it wasn't about us just trying harder. It wasn't about me just gritting it out. It really was about God's commitment to make me good as Jesus is good. So what's God's part in that and what's our part? That's what I'm going to talk about for a few moments here. You know, God's part in this process, it's helpful to remember that growing in the fruit of the Spirit, growing in goodness, is a fruit of the Spirit, okay? It's not a fruit of Brian, it's not a fruit of Bob, it's not a fruit of Jim, it's not a fruit of anything. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in us as we make ourselves available to him. And so God has purpose to do this. Another uh, item I was thinking about comes from Romans 8, 28 and 29. This didn't make it up into the, the notes here, but uh, a number of us are familiar with Romans 8, 28. It's a famous verse oftentimes we'll think about. It's like, and God works together all things for good 
God works together for all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's one that a lot of us remember, we know, but the next verse is actually even super, super powerful as well. It goes on and says that God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Do you catch what that's saying? Like God has chosen ahead of time to make us more and more like Jesus. He's just made it his goal. He's showed ahead of time to do this. He's actively at work for us to have this family resemblance of his goodness. This is God, his purpose. This is what he's intending to do. And he's really bent on making that happen. So that's a little bit about God's process in this, God's part in this process. What about us? What about us? What's our part in this process? I think first and foremost, it's all about just yielding to what God wants to do in us. I think this is the big exchange for me, you know, as a young adult, when I began to realize that as God has already decided to want to make me more like Jesus, if I just let him, (laughs) it actually will start to work itself out. It's not immediate. It's not automatic. But it is something that can happen. It's like God planting a seed in our lives, and then he's watering it. He's cultivating it so that that good fruit of the Holy Spirit will be produced in our lives if we just let him do his work. That process isn't exclusively a passive thing, though. As Jesus points to with the Good Samaritan, there's ways that we actively engage in this. And so back in our story, what do we see there? We see that Jesus also, he invites us to be willing to risk. Jesus gave his life for others, and the good Samaritan risked his life to help this guy in need. And so when we've experienced Jesus' goodness, when we've enjoyed his loving gift, we become more and more willing to take risks on the behalf of of others, to help others. Maybe it's physical danger that we we step into. Maybe it's financial or reputational risks. You know, maybe an example, maybe uh, you lend your car to a neighbor who's in a pinch, their car's in the shop, and like they could crash your car. (laughs) Like there could be real things that could happen with that. But God wants us to be like him and we could help in that way. Or maybe it's offering assistance to a coworker who's struggling at work. Nobody likes that person. They're the annoying one. But like God actually invites you in and say, like, why don't you be an expression of my goodness and my kindness right here? People might wonder why you're spending so much time with them. Might be risking your reputation even. But again, God wants us to be like him and taking risks, helping in these ways. Another thing we see in the story, we mentioned this before, is like this, this willingness to sacrifice. We really can't be good like Jesus is good, unless it costs us something. It's always going to have this little pull in us. It costs the Good Samaritan in Jesus' story safety, time, even money, right? There was real commitment that went there. And he saw some really wonderful things come around. Same thing with us. It will cost us (laughs) to be formed into Jesus' goodness through sacrifice. You know, we want Jesus to change our hearts, and he wants to experience so much of his goodness that we gladly, we joyfully give. We joyfully pay whatever price it is to be good and to shine his goodness to others. Finally, as we mentioned before as well, God's goodness isn't just theoretical. It is actually good. It involves taking practical action, not just good sentiment or good in theory. The good Samaritan met real, practical needs, medical care, transportation, lodging, all of these things. And it's the same thing with us. When we think about being vessels of God's goodness, it's not just in theory, it's in action. And so to do that, we've got to get in there, get our hands dirty. There's so many different ways you can think about this. You can think about this in your neighborhood. You can think about this with family. If you're not sure about, like, even where a place to start, I invite you to do something like with our food shelf. Give away food. Be in this spot of helping those in need. Clinton Becca talked about, you know, serving those with housing needs. 
Like there might be something that God really puts on your heart to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be an expression of his goodness. Help with the clothing closet. Clothing is another really practical need. Maybe you feel the, the uh, draw to like go to a nursing home and visit those that often are experiencing deep, deep loneliness. The options are endless, okay? Options are endless. Here's what I want to point you towards. Don't just think about this in theory. Let's do it in action, okay? Let's do it in action. That's what we see that Jesus points us to in the story. But it's not just about doing good things. Here's what I want to wrap up. All of these practical actions, here's what that does for us. It keeps God's work alive in our hearts. It pushes us to this spot where our hearts are continually transformed. I don't know about you, but if I just think about things, it's just easy to just let those sift, and it can't do the full work in me. But if I put myself out there, particularly in front of real people, and I'm like, oh, God, oh, God, I don't know what to do here. I'm taking a risk. I'm putting myself out here. There's something that happens in my heart when I put myself there, and God shows up. And he reworks things in me. He shapes me in ways that wouldn't be possible if I was just having this all go in my mind. So for you, what might that be? You know, God, maybe in this moment, maybe God is even stirring up a practical idea for you to just put some feet to this. I won't even just give you some grace. You might be totally bad at it. <laughs> you, know? you might totally fail. But do it anyway. Step out anyway. See how God might meet you. Friends, as we experience God's goodness in our lives, it's really natural to be able to give that away to others. So they get a picture of who Jesus is, how good God is, and that can awaken them as God has awakened us. But it's not just about that. It's actually still even about God forming us. As we take those steps... He does in us what we could never do if we just kept this in theory. Okay, again, God is good when he makes us good. He's committed to this. He sent his son to die for us so that we could know him, we could be more like him. And he's given his Holy Spirit to produce in us what we could never muster up on our own. These fruits of the Spirit, that is what God is committed to do if we allow him to do it. So we close, I'd just love for us to just take that step to open up to God and say, God, what are you doing? What are you speaking? What are you showing me? And how can I just respond to you uh, today? So if you would, why don't you go ahead and stand up. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on back up. And uh, so we talked about our part in this process. Again, God has front-loaded so much the place where that so often starts is just being uh, open, yielding to God. I love how we, uh, we sang uh, in that last song before the announcements, just over and over. We say yes. We say yes. Yes, Lord. And I think that's maybe what God's inviting us into today. Even if we don't know all the details, if we don't know what this is all going to look like to take a step, particularly to express God's kindness and his goodness to other people, we can just take the step to say yes and say come. So Lord, would you just, just like saturate our hearts even more um, as Moses had, just this experience of your presence, got an experience of your goodness. God, would you just make that really fresh for us today? I mean, maybe for some folks today, like this is a brand new thing to think about, that like doing this church thing of, of being a Christian or like whatever label you might want to put on it, like it, it really isn't about just trying to be good, like trying harder, but it's about receiving what you've done on our behalf and letting that have its good work in us. How would you just come more and more with your goodness? Help us experience that this morning. Yeah, more God. Yeah, we just open up to that, God. We give you our yes on the front end. Come, Holy Spirit. 
Friend, our ministry team, why don't you start to make your way um, down, and I just want to share a few words that um, came up as I was uh, just praying for our time today. Um, You know, as I mentioned before, I think for all of us, there's an invitation that whatever God is up to, he's already decided it. (laughs) And the big part for us is just figuring out, like, what do we say yes to? And so even receiving prayer today, um, getting out of your seat and, like, having somebody to pray with you might be a concrete way that you just put feet to your yes, whatever that might be. Um, I also had this sense, like, there's just a number of people Uh, When I was talking about the exhaustion of trying to be good in your own strength, like that just hits you like that's me. (laughs) I I feel like there's a number of people, like God just wants to bring this like showers of refreshment. Like it is not about your extreme effort. It's about receiving his goodness. And I, I think in particular, there's some folks that God just wants to be good to you in ways that maybe you haven't experienced ever or maybe in a really long time. Uh, I also had a sense there was a number of people that um, experiencing God's goodness, uh, what you think about is like just confusion. You know, maybe you've been through experiences where like there's a whole bunch of stuff that have happened in life, even recently, (laughs) that feel anything but good. And so how is good? I know for me over this last year, (laughs) that's been a big wrestling match with God. Like, God, how? (laughs) How is this? I just tell you, he is faithful. He shows up as we're just honest with that. And the final thing, um, I just felt like God wanted to release courage um, to a number of people. Um, As we were talking about some practical ideas to put feet to showing goodness to others, um, I think a number of you know exactly what God's inviting you to do, but you just need the courage to do it, okay? Um, So we want to pray for those things, um, but if there's anything else going on in your life, you need physical healing, any other needs, these folks would love to just come before you, uh, bring those things to Jesus. Band's going to lead us in some more worship. You can just soak in God's goodness in that way as well. Whatever that is, God, let us behold you today. God, we want to be more like you. Do that good work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Thanks so much for coming to the vineyard. Let's worship. Let's pray for one another.
with a star that leads me to the humble heart of love I see in you. You are the God of the broken you're a friend of the weak you watch the feet of the weary you embrace the ones in need and I want to be Jesus, to have this heart in me, you are the God of the humble, you are the humble King, you are the God of the humble.
Love 